Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining. We'll get started just here in a second. All right. Uh, my name is Colleen O'Halloran. I'm a programmer for SIF's WTF lineup. And I'm so pleased that everyone is here for the What the Femme panel today at the Seattle International Film Festival. For those of you who don't know, what the, film is, what the Femme is an education series that we have at SIF. This is part of our year-round education program. We talk about women in genre cinema from horror to fantasy to science fiction. Uh, so definitely keep your eyes peeled if you're interested in the films you see today and other films made by women and about women. Um, the What the Femme series is covering those year round. Uh, I wanna make a housekeeping note for everyone. If you have comments during the panel, put those into the chat. If you have any questions, put those into the Q&A. So we'll start with our panelists here in a moment. Uh, we'll, I'll begin with asking them some questions and then we'll open up questions to the audience. So if you have questions that come up, um, put them in the Q&A and eventually we'll, we'll try to get to those. And uh, with that, I think we can go ahead and bring in our panelists. I'm uh, so pleased to, to be joined by five genre filmmakers from this year's SIF. We have Catherine Chidiak Putnam, the director of Inferno, Leela Hala, director of Menarca, DW Thomas, the director of Too Late. Uh, Prano Bailey Bond, director of Censor. Hi. Suki Rose, director of Ding Dong. And let's see. And um, Kath, uh, did I get, oh, I have Catherine too. Okay. Did I miss anyone? No. Nope. Nope. All right. Well, um, again, just a huge pleasure as we were getting this panel together. We thought, wouldn't it be great if we could get, you know, these individuals together? We didn't know if it would be possible because of time zones between Europe and Australia, um, the Americas, and we did it. And, and here we are. And I, I think um, I can say that, uh, you know, everyone, everyone here has watched one another's films that's on the panel. And before we started, we're, we're starting to bubble up some, some ideas and conversations. So uh, it, it's going to be fun to open it up to the audience and, and see what we can explore as far as these films go and the, the themes that you've touched on and also some of the techniques that you've used as filmmakers. Um, and so I just wanted to start with uh, just kind of diving in. And Catherine, if I could start with you. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so Inferno is really about, um, for me, at least when I watched it, you know, family um, and history and also one of my favorite themes, which is haunted houses. So yeah. I'm wondering, could you talk a little bit about what drew you or inspired you to tell this particular story? Yes, absolutely. So um, actually, you know, I write with my partner um, and we both, um, you know, um, two, three years ago, we went to Scream Fest with another film that we had, and he um, had this idea about this, you know, um, door in the middle of nowhere, you know, and just think about, you know, a demolition, a haunted house in, uh, that is demolished basically like that, you know, and then that visuals, right? And then we started kind of digging a lot about us, and, you know, we've been together for three years, and we've been thinking about having kids, but we have... Um, serious mental illness in our family, you know, like a history of that is, you know, really dark and difficult for us, you know, to, to deal with. And then we said, well, let's explore that, you know, let's explore a story about that transgenerational trauma and, and you, you know, and our fears really to be parents and things that goes, you know, from father to son. And, you know, our story is um, probably the only one that has a male protagonist. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it was what we thought it was the right thing for our story. And I think that sort of came organically, but it's really exploring that fear, you know, that fear of inheriting, you know, um, yeah, inheriting that, you know, experience that we had with our parents and we actually leave as well ourselves. So 
Um, yeah, so basically that was our um, probably our biggest inspiration. Um, definitely we delve into things like family, transgenerational trauma, violence, and um, yeah, and obviously haunting house, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the thing that is very exciting is that thing about demolition. It's like, a, it's a different take in the genre as well. So would you say that the monster, like the actual monster in your film is like representational of those traumas and, and you know, those things you were describing? Yes, absolutely. I think that is something that is a metaphorical for sure, you know, and I think that it is, you know, it's that trauma, you know, and that trauma that it, it goes and goes to family, to, to member, to the other member of the family, to kids, you know what I mean? And, and it sort of consumes family. And that's how I felt in my life, you know what I mean? Like those situations, you know, and then, you know, I know that I bring to me you know, until today, you know, from my childhood. And I know that I will bring those trauma, not, wouldn't say maybe trauma, but those experiences to my child, as, if, if I have a kid, you know, to my child as well, you know. And so it's really, for me, metaphorical of that, you know. But I, you know, I, I think that everybody can have a different interpretation. Mm -hmm, I think the mm -hmm. beauty of like horror as well is that everyone is going to project, you know, what you know, how they feel, you know, what is their life and their experiences to those, you know, um, to monsters, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, I like to leave it open, you know, that everyone mm -hmm. can have their own interpretation. And in terms of like developing the actual character of the monster and sort of the, the visualization of that, what was your inspiration for that? Or how did you kind of imagine the look and feel of that actual entity? Yeah, so, so we work really closely with Steve Boyle, and he's a very experienced, um, you know, prosthetics artist here in Australia. But because we have all the fire and the theme of fire, we really wanted to bring that. And at the same time, because the monster is feminine as well, we wanted to bring also like that it looked kind of like a feminine monster. So we have a, a, a woman who is playing the monster and not, you know, a male. Um, and... Um, but we, we, we really looked at the texture. I think the texture, obviously we had some budget constraints, so we couldn't go super far because it's, it's very expensive, you know, working with prosthetics. I mean, like, it's, it, I'm sure the other people here know as well, the other girls as well, because they worked before, you know, and so we had some limitations, but it was really great. We were just Steve, Steve worked in uh, many feature films and uh, we, um, we worked with him, you know, but what are, we wanted was something unique, you know, we wanted to get that texture of fire of like, uh, you know, like um, lava kind of feel to it, you know, we wanted the, to have, you know, we wanted to feel a bit like a nightmare of fire, mm -hmm. I say, sort of, sort of a thing, because the fire is kind of a big thing, symbolism in the film. Um, and um, yeah, so, so it was, but it was really hard, you know, and it was hard for the actors, you know, the actor to be playing that, you know, because it, it's being dressed in the suit and, you know, when you're shooting, you know, it costs, you know, you have to manage your time really well because obviously she couldn't go to the bathroom right. properly, you know, so you, you are constantly trying to make sure that she's okay, you know, and um, so it was a, it was an, really interesting experience. I mean, I've never done it before. Actually, this film is probably, I would say it's my first film, you know, because I've shot like more exercises at uni and I, my background is editing. And, you know, I've just started, I would say, you know, being a filmmaker, like in the sense of directing and writing. So it was challenging, <laughs> but it was awesome. We, we had fun and, and I mean, I love the final, the final monster. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, me too. And and DW, speaking of prosthetics and monsters, uh, there, you know, there's obviously a, a very prominent monster character in your film. And, um, and could, could you say a little bit about working with those, like the practical effects and kind of building that like image of that monster character? Because there were different kind of emanations of the monster at you know, depending on feeding cycles and whatnot. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That was a big thing. I worked with Mo Meinhardt, who is a terrific uh, special effects and prosthetic uh, person, and she was just amazing. So what we, we wanted to do was have the different iterations of Bob, one before he eats, after he eats, and of course, when he, uh, I don't know if I want to go 
give any spoilers away <laughs> in the third one. So uh, what what I really wanted to do was ground the whole character. It's, it's a, a monster, but I wanted it to be very realistic, that it could actually kind of have uh, have a place in, in our world today. And since we set it in the comedy scene and the LA comedy scene, I wanted to feel like this monster could go unnoticed, which, which was a fun part. So developing his, his character, we wanted to keep it in that. Uh, so yeah, so once he, he's a monster that eats people. And so once he eats people, he kind of absorbs them and it sort of becomes part of his skin. So he's sort of like a, a, a worm, like a, a creature. Mm -hmm. And he's still, he's still human-esque, but uh, we wanted to make it kind of believable that he could absorb, a, maybe like a snake more so, because he doesn't quite digest them right away. So it does, it, it sits within his body. I mean, there's definitely a lot of, uh, <laughs> you have to give it up to imagination to, to make it believable, but yeah, it was, it was definitely a lot of fun and uh, I think I think Ron Lynch, who's our actor who played Bob, I think he enjoyed being in the monster outfit more than anything else. Like he sort of lit up and had a lot of fun being being Bob as the monster. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> it does. Yeah, and it actually it, it makes me think of another question, which is I, I felt like too late did this um, did such a good job with keeping like lightness and because you say he had fun like you can tell like it was a fun film like it was it was fun but nonetheless there was always this underlying tension like the sort of real life horror of you know the protagonist and like what she was up against and also like you know just the the sort of like figurative and literal you know terror so how did you make that balance between like keeping things light but like sticking to the horror aspect of things yeah, that's right. We, I, I really wanted to make sure that it didn't get too dark because we were setting it in this world of comedy and I wanted to highlight these comedians and bring in to uh, the, the fact that there is a lot of light and darkness in the comedy world. I mean, comedians are probably some of the, the most pessimistic and negative people I've ever met, but they can also be so incredibly light and funny on stage and then there's that duality. So, so it, it was, it was a, a little bit of a challenge. I think the way we pulled it together was with our score, keeping the score very light and playful and bringing in the accordion and bringing in different aspects that, that gave it that more jovial feel instead of, uh, of, of bringing in a lot of synthesizers and, and sort of those lower tones that definitely make you feel anxiety. And so we wanted to keep it light. And I think the music helped a lot. Also, also the monster himself, we, I, I really love the lovable monster. Like, yes, he eats people, but that's what he is. <laughs> you know, how can you blame him really in the end? He's just trying to survive as a monster. And so I love seeing the vulnerability of the monster and, and Ron did such a great job playing that kind of uh, it, vulnerable and sensitive, but still he's a monster, you know, he still has that dark side. And so I think that really helped keep it light as well. Yeah, it did. I think that, it, that did. And it's interesting you bring up the score because Prano, that makes me think of, you know, the sensor score, I feel like was really just such a driver and the energy. So can you talk a little bit about like your approach to the score and, you know, uh, what it and you know your vision for that and and how that played through yeah yeah I mean sound and music is like such a big part of my work as a director I think when I'm writing I'm normally thinking about sound when I'm kind of working on the script um, but in terms of the score I mean obviously the film is set during the 80s and it's about video nasties so there's a version of this score which is kind of very John Carpenter and very sort of leaning into that that world, you know, that 80s synth. 
And I always wanted to strike a balance with that, that it wasn't kind of becoming like a pastiche, I guess, that it wasn't sort of feeling like a rip off of the films from that era and that it stayed authentic to the story that we were telling. And so that was kind of, I guess, some of the things that I spoke to Emily Lebanese Farouche, who, who composed the music. And actually it's funny because, so Emily, like she, she composed the first piece of music without actually seeing anything. So she, she'd read the script and we talked a few times and she sent in some music and actually we put it to picture and it was like, whoa, this just draws us into Enid, our character. There was something that kind of just made us closer to her. And I think it was because Emily was tapping into Enid's trauma and she was using her, her voice a lot. So it doesn't actually sound like vocals, but she's, I'm not going to try and like sing it because it was, I'm terrible at singing but also it's like really kind of guttural sounds that she was making that were kind of coming from her belly they don't it doesn't sound like voice but actually that's what she was using um and then once we kind of got into it it was really about kind of tracing Enid and tracing you know her journey through the film um and then finding a way that we could kind of pepper in that sort of original 80s synth stuff, but so that it didn't kind of pull you out of Enid's journey. Because I think that that's the thing is like, if you're in this kind of emotional scene with a character and then suddenly it's like, wow, wow, wow. You're just going like, whoa, hang on. I'm not emotionally with her anymore. So it was, how do we use that to like evoke this era and evoke these films, but still stay with her? Um, and yeah, there was some really cool techniques being used generally in terms of our sound. Like we used a, something called a transducer in, in sound design. So Emily and my sound designer were kind of going to the studio and using like the, the like authentic synths from the era. Um, but then the transducer is basically like, um, it's, it's a way of processing sound through objects. So you, what they did is like they have this big piano wire and then they process the sound they send the sound through that into an object so they send it into like the back of a piano and then used a contact mic to record it back so we were kind of recording a lot of the dialogue and a lot of the sound effects kind of through this process and it creates a really surreal dreamy soundscape um, and then also we were kind of going to um, like analog as well because again you were going for that the texture and format for me were a really big part of the film because it's kind of the idea of it is born from the birth of VHS and what happened with horror over here in the UK, like off the back of that. Um, and so like the texture of VHS and the texture of an analog sound were, were like really important to all of us to make authentic. Um, so we just were like, well, we'll just go to tape. So that was really fun as well. I love playing with all that kind of stuff. And, you know, you, you talk about like the era and that time of the video nasties and there was, you know, such a, a prevalence of understanding like, oh, the media is talking about this. Everyone's afraid of this. All eyes are on um, these video nasties of the time. Can you say a little bit about your research process or like how did you dive into understanding and being able to, to tell that story about that, that period of time? Yeah, I mean, I I was obviously really, really young during the 80s. So my experience of the kind of video nasty era over here was very different to um, a teenagers or a grown ups even. Um, so it, it was about like my, obviously I, I love horror and I love these films and I grew up on like Texas Chainsaw and Evil Dead and stuff. Um, but it was when I got older that I kind of got into the other video nasties. Um, but I suppose we, we started with the BBFC, which is, you know, the British Board of Film classification over here. And that was like the first port of call, but um, also like just the horror community over here is a great resource for me because um, it is a community and a lot of the people I know kind of lived through this. So they were the ones doing fanzines and making like generation copies of, you know, I spit on your grave and like posting them around the UK. And so it was a lot of talking to people, but going and speaking to film censors who worked during the, the period was really helpful. 
because I mean I remember speaking to one one woman and I was like what was it like kind of working in this in this environment and she said sometimes it felt really seedy because she felt like she was sat in this small dark room basically watching soft porn you know with no windows and and it was little nuggets of information like that that I felt like I could really feed that into the production design and the kind of um, atmosphere and the feel of the space that they're working in. So sort of wanted the space to feel like we're underground, locked in with these horror films and, you know, there's no windows and no way out. And like, again, you're thinking about how that works sound wise and the kind of echoing, you know, screams coming up the corridors from the other rooms where like, you know, characters being murdered in, in films and things. So you know, a lot of that research kind of fed into the creative aspects. But um, yeah, I also read a lot of books on censorship and watched tons of video nasties, which is, you know, really hard work. Yeah. <laughs> and and Leela, I'd like to go over to you just on this, this idea of sound, because I felt like Menarca, like every sound felt so intentional. I mean, I don't know if it was, but like watching it as someone who's viewing it just like the the wetness and the the kind of sounds of mon that you would imagine monstrosity would sound like um so could you talk a little bit just about like the sound design and your how you approached bringing forth all like you could feel it getting under your own skin I think just like hearing the sounds that came out of that film um I mean first of all I think one of the most challenging things was how to represent a monster in, in, in the film, because there's also this idea that is, we're not seeing a monster as a scary creature, we're seeing a monster as the etymological sense of a monster, like Moneo Mostrare, someone who's coming to show you something. And in, in order to learn from this, creature, a deity, or however you see it, you need to let the monster show. So um, it, it was also, so, so in this game of projection and imagination, it was about representing sound wise, but also image wise, it was about representing, but not too much, not too literal, also leaving some space for for the audience to project on this idea. No? So we've been trying many different things throughout the process of the film, like from teeth, recordings of teeth, to um, also like um, voice from the singer being projected as an instrument and not a voice anymore. And so, We've been trying a lot um, in, in, in how to represent. We've been experimenting a lot. That was also fun. And the script, part of the music was already in my head when I was writing the script, like the drums, for example, they were very present to me. But getting to the location, uh, hearing the sounds and realizing that um, a lot of it wasn't as bucolic as originally written in the script. So bringing motors a lot more present than the, the pure sound of water. And then that's how like the boats got to have motors and what was a bike originally became a motorcycle. And then just like the, the location changed, arriving at the location also changed a lot. And um, what else can I say about, about the sounds? Um, the, yeah, and then when we, when we got to sound design, we really, we were working a lot in, in, in experimenting a lot in, 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 in the sense, but this, this, this wetness is also part of this idea of being working with, um, with, the, the myth of the toothed vagina and this idea of female monstrosity. So teeth and, and wetness, they were very present also intentionally from because of the myth we're, we're working with. And what was the connection there with piranhas? Can you talk a little bit about this idea of female monstrosity and the connection to piranhas? Yeah. 
So um, when I was, I've been, for, for a long time, I've been researching on different myths on female monstrosity. And when I arrived at, at this myth of the toothed vagina, I had seen and read different expressions of this myth in different cultures and different times, but never in Brazil. And I started digging threads to this idea. And, and first, of course, it, it, it belongs to a male imaginary, the way uh, this idea of uh, this uh, crazy idea of vagina having teeth. And we were um, on, on, one, on one hand, we were trying to give this a twist in the story and in the other hand, I was also trying to appropriate that into my own culture. And piranhas are on one hand, they are this, this uh, imaginary of castration, like one of the biggest ones in, in, in my culture, in my country. But mm -hmm. also the word piranha is a female noun in, in Brazilian Portuguese and um, it is a der derogatory way of referring to a sexually empowered woman. Mm -hmm. So if you, in an offensive way, so if, if you want to offend a, a woman by their sexuality, you say piranha woman. And there we were again speaking about hybrid creatures and teeth uh, related to sexuality and this idea. So that's when I started realizing that piranhas and the imagination around piranhas had a lot to do with the toothed vagina myth. And this is how it all started. And there's, I'll just say too, um, there is really this like progression from like fear to power that happens and that, that I loved the, the experience of that as well, so. Um, so Suki Rose, I, you know, for, for Ding Dong, which, oh, wow, that's, uh, it, it, I mean, it packs a wallop, right? I, I don't know how else to say it. In seven minutes, how, you know, a, as a viewer of this film, you, um, you start off in a situation that's like very normal, very mundane, pedestrian even, and then all of a sudden you're like in this kind of like alternate reality. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what techniques you used to bring forth that like mind bending experience and turning that volume up in such a short period of time. Um, yeah, so first of all, I felt like um, the space had to be very specific. I saw a very specific space that was like very sterile, very white and very like felt um, like money that felt like somebody inhabits the space who has money while it's still um, unsettled. So that was one of the biggest challenges, um, even financially was like, I can't shoot this in my house. Like I have to find the right space that's gonna feel right for these characters and feel sort of otherworldly enough while also being, you know, mostly grounded. Um, and I, I mean, I had written this piece specifically for uh, these two actors um, who are incredible and working with them was amazing. Uh, and we had, we did a lot of work in rehearsal around, like I knew that this needed to be short and really, really concise. And so we sort of, um, with Cricket, uh, who plays Lee, uh, the short haired woman, um, we actually mapped out um, the emotional beats within her dialogue. So we rehearsed for a couple of weeks because we had a very short amount of time in the space that we had. Um, I was like, I think we had eight hours including our load in and load out. So not very much. And uh, there was no option to go over. So um, we worked for, for a couple of weeks um, and mapped out exactly like, and uh, where in her dialogue she is emotionally, um, with the intensity because they're both very intense performers and it's a gift to have a performer who you have to pull back you know as opposed to being like give me more give me more so both of them I was like okay so we're just gonna we're gonna hold you back as long as possible until like this point and then you're going through this at this point and uh, I also the you know the sound was really important um 
I worked with a great sound designer, Josh Ascalon, who, uh, you know, we sat and tinkered forever, figuring out like, you know, each of the characters has like a little sound that cues sort of their mental state snapping. And um, it really exists on that. That sound does a lot of the heavy lifting there. And then, yeah, then the production design, keeping it really, um, I had to say a lot with the production design in terms of narrative. I was like, I have, I don't have a lot of time to say what I'm saying. And I, I want this to feel repetitive. I want it to feel mm -hmm. suffocating. I want it to feel like, you know, the, the room and the space and the objects in space are, are physical manifestations of her state of mind and how, you know, that mm -hmm. evolved over those six minutes. Yeah, that, yeah, that, and actually, as you're saying that, I'm just visualizing, like, even, like, the plants kind of reproducing, and, you know, the, the amount of blood, and this kind of, yeah, so the, those little visual cues, I mean, which, it's interesting you saying it now, it's like, oh, yeah, but that was all subconsciously a part of that experience um, that we have as viewers, like, watching that, that unfold, and um, I have a question I would love uh, for everybody to answer. And Suki Rose, if we could start with you um, to put you on the spot here. Uh, what is a, what are some of the tired tropes in genre cinema that we think need a refresh? Maybe pick one. There's a couple of them. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, currently I, I have a couple of projects I'm working on that I'm kind of trying to wrap my mind around. And, um, it's so interesting because I, I feel like um, right now, actually throughout all of genre film history, like motherhood is this really uh, like it's, you know, if we're, if we're talking about women and we have women in a movie and it's a woman's story, um, it's motherhood tends to be the core of that. And, and I find that, um, you know, sometimes can be done in such an interesting way, but I, I also am like a little bit, um, how do we how do we exist in genre outside of the framework of motherhood um and so or like how do you like totally shatter that you know uh motif in general but i don't know i i am always excited when i see stories that involve women that don't revolve around uh motherhood or, or metaphors of motherhood um and uh, yeah, I, I mean, obviously there are some like really incredible examples of, of s stories around motherhood and genre, but uh, I guess on the spot, that would be the first yeah. thing that comes to mind. <laughs> I would have to say uh, sexualizing women to a point where like, even if they are kind of the hero of the story in the end, they end up in like a tank top covered in blood with, you know, their bra hanging out kind of thing, I think, I think empowering women without going to, to that that place would be would be cool, you know. Uh, definitely with the stories that I I love doing, and then with with too late with uh, uh, with Violet's character, it's like she is the one who sort of saves her her romantically. She saves the day, and I, I like that. So I think having more stories that are are empowered without going to the overly sexualized and i would say even like the just to compliment you um thomas can i call you thomas is that how i should oh you can call me you can call me dw or you can call me diana okay dw yeah okay um uh, and I think that is that victimizing, you know, I've been so much like in like, uh, and I think that's something that Prana did in her film, which I really liked as well in Censor, it's kind of like that, um, and I, I've been in a lot of horror festivals watching, you know, for films and shorts, and I love it, you know, and I love those films, those old 80s, 80s films as well as you guys were talking about. But I think it's it's great to see, you know, watch films that, you know, women are just not like tortured or, you know, can we do the opposite, you know? So it's something that I like to do. And and one of the reasons I have a male character as well, it's kind of that as well, you know what I mean? I wanna see men suffer, why is it just women? You know what I mean? So I think that is it's just like that, but but it really that violence, you know what I mean? And I think it's, it's fine, you know, in some films you can understand why you have that, you know, and it's justified, but you know, I think that it's a bit less of that perhaps will be different approaches will be interesting.
in that yeah. regard. It's really interesting, actually, because when I was writing Sensor, you know, obviously we have loads of films within the film. And sometimes I'd be like, oh, I really want to like throw a man in here, you know, a man suffering and because we're so <laughs> used to seeing the woman screaming, running through the woods. But actually they were <laughs> tropes that I was leading into. And when I was kind of pitching the film, I was like, I want to subvert this trope. I want to have the woman running, screaming through the woods in the nighty covered in blood but she's chasing oh. she's not she, you know yeah. she's she's not the one running away and also the way she gets into that costume is with a knowing wink you know it's it's an awareness of that trope but I was also thinking while I wrote it about how used to seeing women being afraid we are and how whether or not you know it's easier quickly to get yeah. somebody into that like if you had that beginning bit of a film, you know, every horror film has that little bit at the front where we're like setting up the, the terror, you know, is it easier if it's a woman? Because that's what people are used to. You know, yeah. we kind of need to like start to see men terrified, I think. Totally, that's my I thing. Yeah. That's for men too. Totally. It's like that Hitchcock thing, isn't it? That Hitchcock said that, you know, that a woman put a woman screaming or something. He has a quote about that. Hitchcock, you know, like that. Uh, I forgot the exact quote, but it's about that, you know, like if you want to terrify, put a woman screaming. And I think that, <laughs> fuck that, you know. <laughs> I think we had it, we, we screamed en enough, you know. <laughs> We've just got better screams. That's probably, that's our problem, yeah. isn't it? Like we scream better, but. <laughs> that is true. That is a good point. Yeah, seeing, seeing weak men is so hard for, <laughs> for men to wrap their heads around unless it's like, uh, part of the character, but I, I guess seeing a man that's like very vulnerable is still not as accepted as seeing a woman who's really vulnerable. But I think that should change, you know? And I think it is in society, men are much more vulnerable these days uh, than maybe they used to be. And it, I think too, you, you know, you see more self-awareness, like Prana, what you're saying with the wink and with more representation and like filmmakers and writers, of genre, um, you know, I, I think we're like the stories are becoming more complex too, in terms of like there's the wink, there's the self awareness, there's like subverting the tropes, um, and almost having fun with it, right? It's almost like a like things have reached um, like a meta level in some ways, which is feels kind of liberating. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder as well as like, I don't know how you all feel about it, but whether or not there's also an expectation as a woman filmmaker to make certain types of films about women and that your kind of work is viewed with a certain political lens if you're telling a woman's story and whether like, because of that, there's like a pressure on us to come up with films about like, you know, periods and pregnancy and <laughs> menopause and things when maybe that's not what we want to be. You know, some people do want to be telling those stories, but maybe we don't all want to be. And, and can we have a space as women where we get that freedom to tell stories about men and about things that aren't traditionally female? I don't, know. I don't know what you feel. Yeah, yeah I, I think about this a lot and it, puts a lot of pressure like I'm I have a couple you know I'm trying to figure out what the next thing is and you know there's this pressure where it's like what what do you take out and put into the world and say this is like who I am as a creator and what I what I want to say and what is the expectation when you walk into a room to pitch something there you know I I personally my experience has been uh they they want you know they want to check the female creator box and they want a piece that says something about being a female creator when like I don't even know what that means anymore mm -hmm. um and like even as we like uh, tear down the gender binaries it becomes even more even less of a a tangible thing uh and and a more difficult thing to like and then it's like you you view your own work through the lens sometimes because you're trying to see how somebody else is perceiving the work and it's like Ooh, I don't know. Um, I don't know what any of it means. And I am, uh, you know, hopeful that, <laughs> you know, we'll get closer to being 
filmmakers and not uh, female filmmakers. Uh, that's like kind of my biggest thing. And, you know, this has been a great conversation, especially because we're talking about craft. And I mean, now we're talking about gender identity as well, but it is always, you know, I, I want to hear everybody talk about their craft uh, a lot more than they're having to talk about what it's like to be um, a female uh, filmmaker. So, uh, and I mean, obviously we can't do it yet because we still have to, we still have to do talk about all this, but I'm optimistic and hopeful that <laughs> eventually we can, you know, focus more on our, our craft and telling exactly what stories we want to tell without um, the pressure or the lens, you know. Totally. Yeah, totally. You know, my partner and I, we always say that, you know, the real change is going to be when a woman directs Batman, you know, because a woman directing, you know, oh, this, I mean, it's great, you know, Wonder Woman stuff. I'd love that, you know, but I, I, I think that we want to direct, you know, Batman, we want to direct, you know, Avengers, you know, when that's going to happen, you know, and, you know, it's what you guys are saying, you know, like, it's just that stop genderizing filmmaking in terms of like that we can't do those those things, you know, we can't do those films. We can make those things. <laughs> you go, Grandma. Yeah. Uh, Leela, I'd love to hear from you in terms of uh, tropes that you think are tired and that you'd like to see a refresh of. Any ideas on that? Yeah, I, I think I have the feeling that not only like when I started thinking of feminism and cinema, I had I was worrying a lot about representation in front of the camera and behind the camera. And at some point I started diving a lot more in, into what kind of stories we're telling and also which kind of structures we're using for the stories we're telling because the, the, the normative way and, I, and, 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 and I'm really happy you're speaking, Suki, about non binarism because that's also a point like the, it's about constructing norms or deconstructing or creating other realities so other possible realities and in the sense uh, that's that's kind of how i started digging into archetypes and 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 the in the narrative structures we're using and the way they they th there's there's already a lead in short like just the idea of a classic structure contains already so much of normativity in itself that you, you need to find another way of telling stories in the structure as well. So, so for me, that's why I started digging into archetypes and, and archetypes are not, for me, not something that is there existing without possibility of changes. They are there because they've been repeated so much that it feels like a norm. It feels like, it actually feels like natural, but it's not. So in a way for me, I'm not looking, I, I don't actually wanna be the director of Batman because I don't, <laughs> it's like, this is, it doesn't interest me as a type of story to tell. So looking to the kind of stories I'm searching for, uh, I'm, I'm really looking to the possibility of having such a diversity in, in, in cinema and filmmaking that we're not repeating archetypes, we're creating new realities. Right? And, 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 and that is not only to the idea of female, non-female, uh, it's, it's throughout all the, all the realities, all the possibilities, all the existences we're dealing with. Right? In terms of the, like the format or the structure for telling stories, some of the films that that you're that you all are screening in this year's SIF are short. Some of them are features, and and I wanted to dig a little bit into that approach and Prano specifically since Nasty played before Censor at SIF this year. Could you say something about um, your process? Did you when you made Nasty? Did you know you were going to do a feature, or did the idea of the feature come after you made the short? Um, I had the idea for the feature first, actually, and then while I was developing 
the treatment I kind of I was like quite keen to make a short but that wasn't um wasn't the same story the, the thing is again going back to the research there's so much like that it inspires me about this period and there were so many characters that were coming to me and and one of them was Enid but then I was thinking about a child's experience during this time and um a lot of the concern was around what these films were going to do to the next generation and you know were we going to be spawning a new generation of murderers that would in 10 years time be kind of going around hacking people to death or you know whatever um and so I was like this could be quite a good way for me to explore the world of this film in this period and this idea I have which is about taking somebody taking a character from like bleak 80s Britain like Thatcher's Britain into this very lurid vibrant world of video nasties and how do I you know how do I create that journey um so I always imagine nasty as being like a a kind of story that could be going on on the other side of town while censor was going on you know um and it was a really good way for me to explore ideas and I there were things in the short that weren't originally in the feature such as the family connection so in Nasty he's looking for his dad who goes missing and then I was like that works really nicely as a through line so I kept that in the feature um and also some of the kind of techniques um I mean we shot on film we shot on 16 mil for Nasty and then that was about getting the texture of the era and making it look as authentic as possible and and having shot on film with that it meant when it came to talking to financiers me and my DP were kind of like yeah they they're trusted they've done it before so it wasn't too much of a concern but also you know things like some of the visual effects going through TVs into other realities and those ideas were all things I knew I wanted to play with in the feature and they gave me room to you know try that out and see if it worked and see if I liked it um but then also coming to pitching sensor and getting the funding it was quite helpful to have this thing where you go you know this is kind of what I'm talking about and it's something really tangible that um maybe especially if you're doing something that is a bit weird I think you know some people might not get it right right away and if you've got something that you go it's this they're like oh yeah okay so it was really helpful for me personally in terms of my prep and also in terms of how we launched and got a sensor off the ground so we have a question from the audience here this is a um it looks like an oft debated topic speaking of um, archetypes uh, in genre cinema about Laurie Strode. Um, so uh, the question is, uh, Laurie Strode from Halloween, do people have opinions here on whether she was um, an empowered character or whether she was um, more of a final girl? Any opinions or perspectives for this question from the audience? Hmm. Sure. You've stumped I mean, us. <laughs> yeah, don't ahead, don't all of the don't, don't all of the murders just kind of happen in front of her? I'm not sure if she actually does she throw does she throw uh the guy down the stairs? Is that her only active I'm trying to remember Halloween? Anybody? It's not, fresh in my, it's not super fresh in my head, so um, yeah. All right, we're all gonna go watch re Halloween. Re watch Halloween. Sure watch it. <laughs> I just remember the the yeah. I, I I always find it difficult talking about the final girl thing as well because it is a trope, and there's something about talking about final girls for me that always makes me just feel like you're just blending all women into one thing and not seeing them as separate characters and so even just I suppose that's what always comes into my head when that is brought up and I've been asked like who's your favorite final girl before and I'm like I don't know I think of them as I think of who's my favorite female character do you know what I mean like it's just but anyway that's not a criticism of the question at all it's just 
my um, my final girl thing. There's also this thing where like, you know, I think all of us probably have a relationship with uh, the history of genre film where you're engaging sometimes with media that um, doesn't care for you uh, as a woman or as um, a person of color or like what, you know, whatever, a, a, any marginalized group you're, you know, you know, I have a, a love affair with horror and I don't always feel like horror loves me back necessarily. So I do sometimes think there's this desire to find answers that ease that relationship. So, you know, there's like been so many incredible academics who've talked about the final girl and, um, you know, where is that archetype uh, role in uh, whatever current wave of feminism we're in um, and a desperation to make peace with it when I, you know, and to see those things as like, no, 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 it's actually like a feminist work or whatever. And, and I, I think that I struggle with that because I, I think there's the discomfort in engaging with media that might not care for you back is important, especially as we're trying to create art that, you know, I don't know, maybe I uh, asks those questions in a different way. Um, so I'm not sure, I know, I mean, there's a lot of people who have spoken really uh, intelligently and wonderfully about those, you know, the, the final girl concept, but uh, mostly I, uh, yeah, I, I think that actually sitting with the discomfort of it is more important than being like, no, actually it's feminist. So that's, that's where I'm at with it. <laughs> And would you would you all say that in terms of you know we could we could say the you know the films films that you've made can be considered what we call WTF kind of like fantastical or like terrifying or just like wild? Would you say you're committed to genre cinema, like making genre movies, or you know Suki Rose, what you said kind of sparked for me this idea of it's it's like you're making your art. The theme may or may not be like in that you know in that terrifying genre or do you find yourselves saying yes this is you know this these are the type of movies that I want to make per personally um you know I I'm not exclusively a filmmaker I'm also a textile artist and I um you know have done all kinds of like worked for imagineering and like you know building robots and stuff like that so to me, it's like, I'm not even dedicated, you know, I'm not even specifically like, yes, I'm a director, yes, I'm a filmmaker, but um, I'm very much like, what am I interested in exploring right now at this moment? Um, it does happen to be that most of my creative work in filmmaking and in textiles work ends up being <laughs> around uh, horror and sci-fi concepts. It is, it does, it just, you know, all, the, all, all roads lead to Rome kind of a thing for me personally. Um, but the through line above it being genre is that um, as much as I've resisted this is that it has, you know, like uh, being funny uh, in a way that is, you know, in a, in, a, in a moment that you don't expect to be funny is kind of the funniest thing to me. So uh, comedy actually has, uh, uh, as much as I've resisted it, emerged as kind of the through line in all of my work, including my visual arts as well, which, you know, better or worse, but, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I'm with you, Suki, on the dark comedy aspect. I think, I think genres are, are they're, they're helpful for the audience because then you know what you're going to see. But at, at this day and age, like, what are Marvel movies? Marvel movies are pretty much, they could be, I don't even know what they call them. There's Marvel movies, you know? Are they adventure? I don't know. So it's kind of like, I, I'm, I'm excited about all, all different types of genres. I think uh, horror is fun and the horror comedy is even more fun. But, but pigeonholing yourself into one genre, I think is very limiting, you know, just going, oh, this is all I make because stories are pretty much part, probably why most of us got, got into it, right? Is we wanted to tell interesting stories and we wanted to have interesting protagonists and we don't wanna just have gore, have a scary aspects. You wanna kind of be able to play with the whole sandbox. So I, I would never wanna limit myself just to horror, but I do love the horror comedy arena. 
I mean, for me, um, horror is a, a delicious field of work and, and dialogue because it is so visceral and it, you're working with something that is so intrinsic, which is fear, which is this idea of uncanny that is really like one work after the other. I, I see myself like dealing with elements of horror, not necessarily in, in a classic horror structure, but I find that genre is this really nice place to play with. No? It's like giving new tools for you to, to, to paint. Um, your picture and 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 it's also challenging so like the I, i've just finished a feature uh, film script that is not it doesn't have any genres in it but then after that i went back to genre and i'm actually like studying and working in musical and Hi. and and playing with this also for the next film so so yeah I find Zhongho really fun yeah so so yeah I definitely um want to keep working with genre because I just love it you know it's like my thing it's what I like to watch as well you know horror and thrillers and um I, I wouldn't say that I'm I think comedy I, I don't think I would be able <laughs> I just don't think like that I can't, I, I, I don't know, I love it, but um, it's not much of my, you know, um, I don't know, I just, I find it writing comedy really difficult, um, you know, and I admire those, you know, who can do that. And, um, but yeah, definitely, I think genre, because I think that uh, horror, thriller and uh, sci-fi, I really enjoy watching. It's not much of my thing, but, you know, it's to keep exploring that because it's, is what I love, you know, I'm passionate about it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's funny because I, I didn't really, I didn't realize I was making genre for ages, which is like quite naive of me looking back at the work I was making, but I just wasn't thinking about it when I started making films. I was like, I want to tell stories and I was drawn to like quite complicated, dark, repressed, twisted characters. And through that, like and using your imagination in terms of what can happen because in in horror you know um like it becomes a metaphor for what's going on inside the person doesn't it it's like it's the return of the repressed and the thing that you're ignoring in your life that's going to come and get you because you're saying la 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 and, you know it didn't happen um and i i think that's a really exciting space to be working in but once somebody pointed out to me that i was a genre filmmaker like quite early in making shorts I was like yeah fine that's okay because if people recognize me for something you know it's easier for you to kind of fit it you do get pigeonholed a little bit but I think that once you establish yourself as a good filmmaker hopefully you can kind of branch out and and do other things and I've always had a, a sort of never say never attitude even though I, I can't see myself doing a rom-com but you never know but I think my I've landed in kind of my genre being nightmares like I, I guess <laughs> nightmares can be you know a dark drama it can be a thriller you know it's I but I do love surrealism and I do love horror so uh, you, you don't want to kind of like uh, I don't know trap yourself in the idea of what you could be creating and say this is me I think it's important to think that you can expand beyond that but at the same time, it is delicious, isn't it, horror? So mm -hmm. it's an attractive one to be continuing to work in. We have a question yeah, from the... Oh, sorry, Actually, go I ahead. I wanted to ask Prana real quick. Uh, the ending of your film, it, it took like a, a turn that, I, I don't know if you want to go into any details, of course, on this, but it was, it did feel like it was a mix of genres, which it was so cool, you know, all of a sudden, we were going into a different direction and, and it was more surreal. And I, I, I'm, I guess I'm asking what kind of, what made you go down that road? What made you decide to sort of go in that direction for your ending? 
Um, uh, it's tricky, isn't it? Because I don't want to give too much away, but I suppose, hmm, how do I say this without giving too much away? I, I love it when people get what they want in films, even if that comes with a price. And I, I wanted Enid to get what she wanted. Um, and I guess when you're talking about fiction and reality, that was my way of dealing with that. I mean, I loved, I loved making the ending. Like it was one of my favorite parts of the film and I enjoyed it so much. I think it'll probably inspire, you know, what I do next tonally. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I, it's tricky. I don't want to- Yeah, no, you don't have to say it. Away. I always find it really hard because a few people have asked about the ending and I'm like, yeah, how much do you say without spoiling it? <laughs> And we have a, a question from the audience here. Um, if anyone is comfortable talking about financing, uh, the question here is, do you feel that working with the genre subject matter helps or hinders the ability to get financing for a film? I mean, I when I would say there was like a few years ago, I was like, okay, I'm a female director and I make horror films and nobody really wants either of those things. That was then. <laughs> Now, actually, I think it's quite popular to be a female director working within the genre. Um, and I definitely think over here in the UK, there's an appetite for that from financiers off the back of, like, I think it started with The Babadook, to be honest. I think that film made people with the money strings go, oh, wow, this, mm. you know, audiences want to go and see this stuff and horror can be about something which, all of us horror fans already knew, um, but I think that convinced them. And now, I mean, yeah, I, I see a lot of companies over here and a lot of financiers being way more open to horror um, than they than they ever have been. And companies that wouldn't normally have made horror kind of going, oh, well, Get Out was a big hit. Maybe we should be doing something a bit like that. I think it's fine to... I think it's hard to find financing no matter what you're making. But mm. uh, I do think if you can describe your film concisely and you know what your audience is, that's always easier to find financiers because then they know that they have a chance of making their money back. And especially when you just start out, I think, I think being as honest and true to yourself and just telling authentic stories is your best bet because if, if people love you for who you are then you're going to have the most fun in the long run making movies because you know it, it's such a gift to be able to make movies and to create art so i guess i i guess what i'm saying is uh it finding finding the money where you can find it and starting off small if you have to and then if 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 you're really passionate, people will see that passion and you'll find your audience. And then when you find your audience, you'll start finding your financiers. I mean, for me, I was doing already, I was in the process of financing a feature film by the time Menarca came out and had this really nice um, trajectory. And I've been asked a lot if I was working with Jean Ho in the next film, and I'm not. Like I'm, I'm working with Jean Ho in the next, next, but not, not in the one I was uh, financing at the time. And I, and I did. I also felt there was a lot of appetite for that, but at the same time, um, I'm, I'm also like, especially for speaking to um, people who are trying to start to find their language as. DW is saying, I mean, it, it, you shouldn't, like, I don't want to fall into a trap of reproducing myself and something that work out in one film. Like, each film is a completely different journey. So I also don't want to be, right, one thing works, but that's that belongs to that film and not to the other process. So yes, I felt that there is a thirst on, on, on genre and in this moment, in, in the spaces of financing and the talks with producers I've been having. But I wouldn't use that as a stimulation on um, working with genre just because it's easier to finance or not easier because it's, it's not, I, my, in my opinion.
I think there's, uh, I think I, it's financing is something that I think that like radical transparency around would be beneficial to everybody who's trying to make films in the first place. And um, cause I think you see something and you're just like, wow, like how do they do it? And uh, a lot of the times the answer is money and to, you know, I paid for my short film out of my own pocket. I, I, I saved for it and I planned for it and I spent $5,000 to make this thing and decided that that was a good investment in my uh, creative life in general. Not that I necessarily know if I'll get to continue to make things because at a certain point it's like, it's expensive. It's a really expensive art form. And like, on that really sucks. <laughs> it really sucks that you need a lot of money and uh, to make movies. Um, but I think that, um, the next thing I do, uh, the idea is that I'm going to make a short version of a feature I want to make. And, and I think that there is something to convincing a financier you can handle something because you have the thing already in a shrunk down format. So um, I don't know. I, I, guess I'm, I guess I'm still too early in my journey with it and you know, engaging with financiers to, to say whether or not being a genre filmmaker is uh, you know, helpful or harmful, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. It's the worst part of making movies. It's, it sucks. <laughs> and I mostly, you know, have spent a lot of time producing, um, before this was my first thing I directed. Um, and I'm kind of, that's this part of my journey, but, um, you know, even, you know, producing and working with writers and other directors, trying to secure funding, trying to find the right company to work with the right voice. It's like, it's a nightmare. <laughs> it sucks. Also, you can wear a lot of hats. If you can do more than one position, like produce it, direct it, edit it. Uh, if you can, you know, the more you can do, the cheaper it always is because you don't have to pay yourself. I mean, point. And I think like here in Australia is a bit different though, because we have government fund. So we have a lot of support from the government, which is something that we have in Brazil as well. But I believe in America is different. That right? we use, excuse me, but that we use to have in Brazil before 2019. Oh, yeah, for Bolsonaro. This yeah, is over. It's, sorry <laughs> to interrupt, but it's important to say. Yeah, used to before Bolsonaro, you know, unfortunately, you know, we are living. <laughs> but here in Australia, we do as well. So our short was supported by the government. So the Queensland government, and they were very generous and they love genre. They love genre. They are super supportive of female directors and diverse voices. You know, I'm Brazilian, you know, and they supported me, you know, and I think it's really cool to have such a progressive, you know, government funding that is looking for, you know, that they are open to support, you know, diverse voices and, you know, obviously us women and, and genre. They love genre cinema. So that's cool. I'm so jealous. I know, <laughs> me too. There's a lot of places where uh, governments will give filmmakers or even artists in general money. And I'm like, what? Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> I think we are lucky. We are very lucky. I, I think so, you know, and um, yeah, they're amazing. It's, uh, it's the same yeah. here in the UK. I mean, my film was funded by the BFI and Film Wales and Film 4 and BFI and Film Wales are lottery funded. So gambling <laughs> on the movie but it's interesting what you were saying Sika Rose because it made me think about how like um also the conversation around financing sometimes can change the idea of a film or has the risk of changing the idea because some people will come in and go we want this to be, be more universal or we want this to have this actor in the middle of it or all of those things and when we were first talking about censor a lot of the questions were like why isn't it contemporary why isn't it set, you know, why isn't it now? And I had to really defend that because obviously shooting a period film is more expensive. Yeah. And also like, they might think that audiences are more engaged with something that's about current times. So I'm really, obviously really glad because I think I was always like, well, one of the unique things about this film is the period that it's set. And, and we can look back in hindsight at censorship and at horror films, you know, which is, actually very interesting to be able to be objective um, about it rather than be in it and and so it, so you know it's like 
I think as a director or writer or even producer, it's like when you're having those money conversations, you have to be really firm in like why you're choosing to tell this story like this and who is going to come on board with that money because they might want it to be this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's that's just something to keep in mind, I think, holding your, on to you. Your period execution, though, was, was so solid without being like overbearing. I like costuming is so, I, you know, I, I do, a, since I'm a fiber artist as well, but costuming is always like one of the main things I'm like, ooh, like that's not right. That's not period accurate or whatever. But like, I, I specifically noted in your film, I was like, oh, like the, all of the wardrobe in this and the production design is so solid. Like, I mean, being, I mean, it is, it makes it more expensive. And that like producer goblin brain of mine is just like too expensive. You can't, you can't have a great <laughs> film, you, you know, and Catherine, I, I, you know, you have a, you know, fire. I was just like, oh man, like this is brutal. You guys really killed it. <laughs> We had we had uh, fire on set as well. We had to build the set to have the fire in it, you know, and it was scary. I'm gonna tell you that I was like, oh my god, is this gonna get on fire? Like, can you imagine like burn down anyone? <laughs> and it was at the uni that I, you know, that I went to. We, we used this, their sound stage, and I'm like, God, they're gonna hate me. Like, <laughs> I was panicking. I'm not because it was my first time, you know. You know that thing you know the first time you know and you're just like so anxious about it. but it was worth it it was awesome i like it and i was like yes this is great <laughs> all right well i i want to thank all of you so much for your time i know it's getting very late where some of you are still very early for others oh, so but <laughs> just really um a joy to have you all in the same like box, you know, for us to to hear from and learn from, and and for the audience, if you if you haven't seen the the, the films made by our, by our filmmakers, invite you to to look those up and and watch them. And um, again, just thanks so much for your time, and all the best, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you.